Question 9. Figure 17 shows a crane lifting a concrete block from the bottom of a deep pool of water. The top of the block is a distance h below the surface of the water. The force on the top of the block due to the water above it is 41,000 newtons. The pressure due to the water at the top surface of the block is 66,000 pascals. Calculate the area of the top surface of the block. So that's our target. Right, what equation do we know that's got force, pressure and area in? Well, it's this one. Pressure equals force divided by area. Now let's rearrange that to get the area. So if P equals F over A, that means that A equals F over P. Bang the numbers in. If you're wondering what a Pascal is, it's 1 Newton per metre squared. And that comes out as 0 0.621. The density of water is a thousand kilograms per meter cubed. So density is represented by a wiggly p called rho. Calculate the distance h between the top of the block and the surface of the water. Gravitational field strength g is 10 newtons per kilogram. Use an equation selected from the list of equations at the end of the paper. Right, let's have a look. Right, there it is. H, wiggly P for density, gravity, and that's pressure. Well, we've just worked out pressure from the last part of the question. So pressure is the height of the column of the liquid times by the density of the liquid times by the gravitational field strength. Now, this is quite a tricky concept. I've got a lovely video on my channel. If you'd like to have a little look at it, click the link above. So I've got the pressure equals the height times by the density times by the gravitational field strength. And we'll need to rearrange that to get H so if I put a line under both of these, so we need to get H by itself and on the top, so we need to get these two things shifted onto that side. So let's take the density first. It comes across the bridge onto this side, and because it's crossed the bridge, it needs to cross the line. So it'll end up on the bottom. G has to cross the bridge to go across the other side. Now it needs to cross the line, so it'll end up on the bottom. I'll just rewrite that, make it neat. So the pressure from the last question is 66,000. The density is 1,000. Gravity is 10. And that equals 6.6 .6 metres. Part 3. Explain why there is an upthrust produced by the water on the block. Right, you'll always get an upthrust when you've displaced water. Okay, the upthrust is equal to the weight of the water that you've displaced. So that would be an easy way of getting two marks. But the thing is, you might not understand what that means. Again, if you haven't had a look at my video, click the link above. It might make it clearer for you. If you want a more in-depth discussion of this, right, what we've got here is there's a column of fluid. I'll call that height 1. So the pressure that's acting on the top of the object is going to be equal to the height of the object 
calling that h1 times by the density of the water times by the gravitational field strength so i'll say that's the pressure at the top of the object now there's also a pressure at the bottom of the object pressure on the bottom of the object and that if i call this h2 height 2 that's going to be height 2 times by the density of the liquid times by the gravitational field strength now you can see what's going to happen h2 is bigger than h1 so the pressure at the bottom is going to be bigger than the pressure at the top Now, you know that there's another formula for pressure. The pressure also equals the force divided by the area. Now, the area of the top of the object is the same as the area on the bottom. So what we're seeing is that the pressure is proportional to the force. So that means that the force on the bottom is also going to be greater than the force at the top. Now because there's a difference in these forces, okay, because you've got a big force on the bottom of the object and you've got a smaller force on the top, that's what creates the upthrust. Now how would you write that? Well like this It's always a tricky question, that one. Students often struggle with it. And here we go. Here's a six marker. Part four. The crane raises the block until it is high enough out of the water to be loaded onto a lorry. The block moves upwards at a constant speed, even though the lifting force in the cable changes. Figure 18 shows the graph of how the lifting force changes while the block is being raised. So there's time along the bottom. Now the amount of lifting force is constant up until 120 seconds. Then at 120 seconds something happens and the amount of lifting force required increases until it gets to a maximum of 17 kilonewtons and that's at a time of 140 seconds so if we have a look at the picture again can you think why the lifting force might suddenly increase well if you said it's because the top of the block eventually reaches the water now you start to pull the block out of the water now at that point we haven't got as much up thrust helping us to lift so we're going to have to take the the real weight if you like of the block when it's in the air so this part is when the block's being lifted up through the water at this part here is when the top of the block reaches the water and then this part's where the block's being pulled out of the water eventually at this part here all of the block is now out of the water and the crane has taken the full weight of the block 
and it's just continuing to lift the block in the air. So, how do we structure that? Well, once again, make sure that you're using the values on the graph because by simply quoting some of the values, we can get some marks and then we'll explain what each part means for some extra marks. So let's break the graph down. I've kind of got section one where it's flat, section two where the force is increasing and then section three. So if we can see two things about that, two things about that and two things about that, Bob's your uncle. Six marks. So part one is between a time of zero and 120 seconds. Right, the next section of the graph is between 120 seconds and 140 seconds. Now we can see our thrust is decreasing because there's less water being displaced because the block isn't as submerged anymore. And finally, section 3 happens between 140 and like 170. Now, if you can, always quote your values. And there we go. There's probably other things you can say, but that's probably the easiest way of answering it. Question 10 here. Figure 19 shows two electrical devices for heating water. Immersion heater and a kettle. The current in the element of the immersion heater is 14 amps. Right, we've got 14 amps in the immersion heater. Now, this is a battery which is DC, direct current. The power of the immersion heater is 130 watts. And that's that's I for current. So we've got the current, we've got the power. Calculate the resistance. So resistance is our target of the immersion heater. Give the answer to two significant figures. Right, well, we're probably going to go an extra mark. So the calculation will be worth two. And then we'll go an extra mark for making sure we we'll get the sig figs right. Okay, so can you think, what equation do we need that connects P, I and R? If you were thinking power equals current squared times by R, so I squared R, then you were right. Okay, now we're going to have to rearrange that in order to get the resistance. So once again, we'll use our handy little tip of doing a line underneath. And we need R on the top, which it is. So we just need R by itself. So if we take I squared over to this side, and then because it's crossed over the bridge, we need to cross the line as well. So it comes down to the bottom. Let's just write that again so it's nice and neat. Pop the numbers in. And the resistance comes out as 0 0.66. Now, in actual fact, let us put the full number so there would be a 3 after that and a 2 and then a 6. 
now. Let's make sure you understand significant figures. They're wanting it to two significant figures. So how would you write it? Do you know when the first significant figure gets triggered? The first significant figure is any figure that is not zero. So this is the first number that's not zero. So that's our first significant figure. So the two significant figures would just go down to that. Now if we look at this number here, it's a three. So that means that the six is just going to stay as a six. So in this case, two significant figures is 0.66. Make sure you understand about significant figures because it's a shame to drop a mark. Part two, the current in the heating element of the kettle is 8.3 amps. Stay two differences between the movement of charge in the heating element of the kettle and the movement of charge in the immersion heater. So what do they mean by movement of charge? Well, it's current and the movement of charge is electrons. So what have we got here? We've got a kettle and it's plugged in to the mains. So this is going to be alternating current. Now in alternating current, the electrons move backwards and forwards. Now some people would be tempted just to explain that DC, direct current, means that the electrons just flow in the same direction. And they'd pop it here, hoping for a second mark. But really, that's just the flip side of the same coin. So I would just pop that in here and I would come up with something else for my second mark. You've got to make sure you understand the difference between how charge flows in alternating current and how the charge flows in the direct current. Now what else do we know? It's gave us this new information and it wants us to use it. If all I put that is that, then I'm not using the new information. So how can I use that? So the kettle, the current in the kettle is 8.3 amps. So the current here is 14 amps and the current here is 8.3 amps. Now the charge equals the current times by the time. So if you've got a bigger current, you end up with a bigger charge. So over here, we've got a bigger current, so we've got a bigger charge in the battery. Okay, so if the current was flowing for the same amount of time, the one with the biggest current must have the biggest charge flowing. So the rate of flow of charge is bigger in the immersion heater because it has more current. And finally, if it says the total there, yep, yeah, here's the last question. And it's another six marker. Question B. Figure 20 shows the three pin plug used to connect the kettle to the mains. A fault occurs in the kettle, causing the live wire to touch the metal case of the kettle. Explain how the safety features of the plug operate when this fault occurs. So they're wanting you to explain if you know what the earth's all about, the earth wire. And they want to know if you understand what a fuse does. So let's start with the earth first of all. So first of all, we need to connect the earth wire to the metal case. That's always the same. Now the reason for that is if there's a fault and the live wire becomes loose and touches the casing of the kettle and then you touch the casing, the casing will be live so you'll get a shock.
because the earth wire is connected to the casing, the current will go down through the earth wire and it'll go to the earth, as in the planet that we live on. Now that current will get spread out across the earth and it'll be safe. So you won't get a shock. So the earth wire is very much a safety device. Now what does the fuse do? Well the fuse is for safety as well. It's basically a thin wire that's designed to get hot and melt and break the circuit if more current flows through it than it's designed to take. So, a fuse is a thin wire designed to allow a certain amount of current to flow through it. If too much current flows higher than the fuse rating, then the fuse will get hot and the wire will melt. The fuse wire will melt and break the circuit. That will protect the appliance and the user. And that's it. Thank you very much. I hope you've learnt a lot there. There'll be plenty more videos coming from where that came from. If you haven't already subscribed to my channel, make sure you've subscribed, please. Smack that bell icon so you don't miss any videos. All right, bye for now. Work hard, be nice, stay safe. Want to see more videos like this? Subscribe to my channel, GCSE Physics Explained. Thanks very much and bye for now.